Faustan uh, Limicula. Uh, Hello, Raquel. Nice to meet you here and thank you so much for having this time so we can talk about uh, your piece Histoire du Théâtre 2. As far as I know, this is a series that started with the uh, Engent artistic director Milo Hau. He already did one piece and now you are doing the second part uh, more focused on the National Ballet of Zaire. Milo Rao, he reached out and said, uh, as the director of uh, Antigent, I'd like to invite artists to, you know, to propose, to be part of a series that I would call Histoire du Théâtre, History or Histories of Theatre. And I'd like you to be part of that history. Uh, I started reflecting on what could be my oldest memories of performance. Mm -hmm. And with time, I, I came to realize that it was not something I saw on stage, but it was rather something that I'd seen on television. On the mm -hmm. Zairean national television, I remember seeing what I couldn't know then, because, but later on I came to understand that it was the National Ballet of Zaire, and which was formed uh, I, I realized then when I started doing my research that, oh, actually this National Ballet was founded by President Mobutu in 1974, which is the year I was born. So it's like, okay, there is something here. I can make something personal about the beginning of the National Ballet in the year I was born. And the National Ballet with, because there is something very special about the, uh, what came to be known as National Ballet uh, on, uh, on the African continent, because the very first one to invent and uh, to set up a National Ballet was President Sekou Touré in Guinea-Conakry. Mm -hmm. And Sekou Touré uh, got to the National Ballet idea from one question. How do you create a sense of a nation when our people identify themselves, first of all, with their ethnic group or with their tribe. And so for him, he was convinced that uh, the biggest enemy of the, the new independent African states was not so much neocolonialism, but tribalism. Sure. And so, uh, because all these borders were invented by Europeans in the 19th century, they never consulted people there. So th you had artificial borders uh, putting people together, but people who did not necessarily identify with one another in that sense. And so Secouture's idea was that if he could invent a place where they could bring together all their dances, all their musics, by putting them together, these dancers and these musics would stop being the dance of this ethnic group or that ethnic group to mm. become the national uh, dance, to become the national music. So a way of constructing national identity mm -hmm. through the body, through the dance. And as a dancer, I found it fascinating that a politician, when ask, asking himself the question of how to create a sense of a nation, he could yeah. turn to dance. Sure. But then that was the problem because, yeah, Secouture was a politician. And politicians, as we know everywhere, they're not there to ask questions. Mm. They're there to impose answers. So for him, the National Ballet, which could have been a fantastic space um, of reflection on what does it mean to call ourselves Congolese, Senegalese, um, Ivorian? And so a, a place to think the nation, you know, it became for Sekouture and, um, and many other African leaders who adopted that model later, it became a space where they were telling the people what to be Congolese meant, what to be Senegalese meant. And so, what could have been a fantastic opportunity became just another tool for propaganda. Sure, definitely. And, and so with time, the National Ballet uh, on the continent played two roles. Within the country, there were spaces to educate people about what uh, being a citizen means. But for outside, they became like a diplomatic tool 
so that if there was an Af um, a, a summit of the African uh, Union uh, organization, every mm -hmm. president would go there with their national ballet. There'd be like a competition. Everyone's saying, my dancer is more beautiful than yours. And another interesting thing for me was that this project started as a way of counteracting the colonial thinking, thinking. But I'm fascinated that they chose the name Ballet, which is like amongst the biggest landmarks of the colonial, um, of Western thinking, of mm. well, you know, Western conceptualizing their arts. So it was this space where, where somehow there was a lot of confusion. Sure. So they, they chose the name Ballet, and for National Ballet, they built frontal theaters, like in Europe. So you had these big houses where people performed in front of others to show them what uh, a national ballet is, but all that in the name of finding our roots, finding our authenticity. So mm -hmm. it was with all these questions that I approached this project, History of Theater. Sure, it's very interesting. I was thinking that this is not the only, the only country that thought about art as a tool for, uh, for African liberation. And even when I think about the ex ex-Portuguese colonies, uh, literature was, were, was also always very present, not only as a, as a space of reflection uh, of liberation with Amico Cabral, Lachitinet, all these uh, intellectuals that were in Portugal, but producing knowledge, and also in the guerrillas, so I, I, I completely understand that it became as, uh, as a good idea, but then it was finally uh, instrumentalized and used uh, for neocolonialism. Neo and I would like to understand if you, if you see your work as a continuation of that project, of this construction of a nation or a reconfiguration of a nation. Definitely, definitely. Only that the big difference with um, like, the national, the national ballet projects and many other projects like that uh, on the African continent, like you know we've mentioned with President Senghor or Amilcar Cabral or even Sabra Machel, and the national ballet uh, of Mozambique, which was one of the most famous on the continent. The big difference is that they pretended to have answers. I go into that space with the question. Mm. What is it? Sure. What is it? What does it mean to be uh, Congolese, to be mm. African? What is it? Yeah. So I don't have the answer. So my, my work is that constant quest for, um, uh, for the answer, knowing that there could not only be one answer. Definitely. You know? Mm. And that's, that's maybe, that's reflecting in the artists involved because uh, you come from a very humble position of trying to understand what uh, the Congolese nation could have become. And you are working with actors, dancers, singers, and griots that made part of the national theater. So exactly. I would like to understand how they, how were their roles um, in the construction of the text, because they are they, they arrive with their own experiences, with their own memories. Uh, how did you construct the piece together with them? So already, I think um, if I turned to them, it was when I started realizing actually that I could not, I probably I could not be doing what I'm doing without that history. You see, when you're young and you start making work and you call yourself contemporary artist, right? somehow you tend to look at the past with like a distance. It's like, oh, this is not interesting. We are going to, you know, no, to be the avant-garde. We'll bring revolution and all that. And until one day you sit down and say, oh, okay. But I didn't start out of the vacuum. There were people who started this journey. It may have been instrumentalized. It may have been used as a tool for, for propaganda, for political propaganda, but still, they started the work. Mm -hmm. And so if I come here, I continue and question it 
with my own tools, but they started the work. So how can I pay homage to these people, but not from the point of view of the institution, but from the point of view of the individuals who are part of that institution. Mm. And so from the very beginning, there was this question for me of trying to meet some of the artists who have been part of the National Ballet from its beginning in 1974. Mm. And, and parallel to that, it was also trying to get from the archives of the National Television Broadcasting Corporation, like footage from the very first piece that they, that they performed, which was called Epopee de Lianja, Lianja Epic, to try and get that footage. And when I met three of the elders who had been in the National Ballet, since uh, its beginning, two were then uh, joined in 74 and the third one in 75. And today they're like uh, a bit like the pillars, the memories of that, the living memories of that ballet. Mm -hmm. And I got footage from the uh, National Broadcasting Corporation. Mm -hmm. And it was the first time I watched it also trying to see the names, you know, uh, on the titles at the end or at the beginning. And, you know, I was struck by the fact that no performer's name was mentioned. Wow. So what? you had, you had the name of like the um, National Ballet uh, director, mm. who today is still the artistic director. Wow. So 46 years later, the man is still there. His name was there. You had the name of the, the, uh, you know, the French, the Franco-Italian theater director who was the director of this first piece. Okay. Yeah, and which is another twisted thing that for a piece talking about our authenticity, Mobutu chose a Franco-Italian uh, guy who was doing theater you know, somewhere in Congo and he was also studying ethnology and stuff like that to wow. be the director of his piece. Wow. He chose um, this story of Lianja, which is an epic telling the beginnings of the Mongo people. The Mongo are one of the most important ethnic groups in the Congo. They're from the Northwest region of the Equator province. Sure but he extended it into being like the origin of the whole of Zaire. Mm -hmm. But this story, um, he chose one version, what had been transcribed by Flemish missionaries. Okay. You know, so yeah. they didn't go to the Mongo people to ask them uh, eventually, because there are people in Mongo uh, land who know that story, but he just picked one that uh, was transcribed the missionaries. Mm -hmm. And, but no dancer, no singer was mentioned. There was no name. And this for me is probably uh, like the most political um, work I can do, it, which is to bring the individual mm -hmm. at the forefront of the project. Mm. And in a country where all the time individuals have always been negated, because that's the nature of dictatorships. Individuals do not mm. exist. We are just like sheep who have to follow the one individual in society, that's mm. the president. It became then about inviting Papa Gondongo, Mama Wawina, Mama Njoku on stage to just mm. tell us their stories. Yeah. How is it that they joined this company? What were their dreams at the beginning? Do they still dream? What mm -hmm. did it mean to them? So it became about the individuals and not uh, about the story of this big machine. Yeah. 
this is very interesting that these stories are so recent that you are still able to, to make this work with these actors. Uh, because it's not just a work of oral history, uh, it's all, there's also this level of uh, archive because you are also working with footage. So I think it's very, it's very uh, interesting to, to confront these two sources. What is also interesting is that the National Theatre itself, it's an example of how um, a colonial uh, structure works because there's extractivism, there's exploitation, there's the, the, um, the completely erasure of, uh, of the actors. What I would like to, to question is, there's something that I believe it's, it has the same effect, which is the bodies that we put on stage with a, with a political function. Because as you said, Mobutu was, uh, was concerned about mixing the tribes on stage to, believe, to see if the, uh, an idea of national identity could grow from that. So I'm really curious about what do you, what is the role of the of the Oscar von Rompuy as a, as the only white artist, as the also the initial narrator of the piece? Because national ballet were like spaces to question the nation, and the nation, the the idea of nation state as we know them today on the continent were 19th century Europe invention. It was important for me to have a white performer, a Belgian performer in the piece, because then it could extend uh, the, um, the conversation beyond just the post-colonial, but into the colonial itself, mm, mm. but not in a dogmatic uh, uh, way, but through the body. Mm -hmm. Because let's take, for instance, uh, the example of Kenya. Because it, um, in 1962, when Kenya became independent, um, Jomo Kenyatta, who was one of the leaders there and who became the first president, Jomo Kenyatta and the other fa fathers of independence in Kenya gave to British settlers the possibility of becoming Kenyans. Mm. And so until today, there are white Kenyans, British Kenyans. And one of them, one of the most famous of them was uh, Dr. Richard Leakey, who was a scientist, who, who was minister for uh, um, ecology and environment, you know, and wildlife conservation. So that was a possibility in Kenya, but in Congo, independence meant kick the Belgians out of this country. Mm -hmm. Let's get them out of here. And so, for me, it's like, could that be actually the beginning of all the troubles that we're going through today? Because that meant that all that history, we were cutting it from ourselves and say, it's done. It's, it's as if Belgians never existed and we never stopped to imagine more profound ways of dealing with the Belgian and dealing with the Belgians in us. So it became about the politics, sharing power and getting uh, you know, the economic machine. And so somehow, I don't know, I can't pretend to have the answer, but I'm just wondering if by understanding independence as get the Belgian out of the picture and yet retaining all Belgian institutions, all Belgian uh, education system, uh, we were actually cutting ourselves from a possibility of deeply reflecting on how we became a nation in the first place. Definitely. So I went into this fiction where I kind of think because you have five performers on stage, so the three elders, 
Papim Buitzi, who's a Congolese actor, a long time collaborator. Um, so he's like my alter ego, because there had to be someone who saw the, the National Ballet on TV, like me, and someone of my generation on stage. So Papi is playing that role, is us, all of us there. And then you have Oscar Van Bompay, uh, a Belgian actor, a member of the Antigent um, artistic troupe. As the white guy, as the Belgian uh, person, and we go into this fiction, say, imagine in 1960, mm. Patricia Mary Lumumba and all the fathers independent had left that possibility for Belgians to become um, Congolese. Mm. Then in 1974, to start the National Ballet, we could have had two extra tribes the Flemish and the Wallon. Mm -hmm. And so we, could we have had them in the first piece of the National Ballet that was talking about the coming together of this nation? So, but this also becomes like a, an opportunity to talk about the how the very, very complicated relationships between uh, our countries to date because um, of this history that is not recognized on both ends. You know, for many um, children growing up in, uh, in Belgium today, it's as if Congo never existed as part of Belgium, you know. Sure. So that negation of that co you know, common history uh, becomes, uh, you know, also a topic for the show but again, without making big speeches about it. Mm -hmm. But still, I think it's interesting where you present the piece and the, the meanings it, uh, it gains uh, in a specific context. Because in Portugal, we also live a huge negation of our colonial history. And this is something that we have been working <laughs> a lot, not only as activists in the streets and formulating uh, um, ways of, of, of struggle, but also in the academic field. and. How, how do you think your, your, this, this piece will be received in Portugal? Do you think it will gain other uh, layers of uh, interpretation? I hope mm. it can be part of the ongoing conversation. Um, that's really my hope, you know, because I was in Lisbon a few months ago when Bruno Candé sure, was assassinated. Yeah, I was there also, yeah. And I remember going in front of the Teatro Nacional Dona Maria Segunda sure. for that rally to honor him. I was moved, but I was also angry mm -hmm. to see his portrait in front of that building mm. knowing that as an actor it can be a dream to be to have your portrait there and to be recognized in some of these houses but we had to wait for him to be killed for him to be visible so it's like do we need to get killed to mm. finally gain some visibility um what is it how is it that all these years after um, you know, you know the, the, the so-called independences and all that, there is still such a huge negation of this history. Mm -hmm. And so what is it that I can hope from this work here in Portugal, uh, that's in Lisbon, because it's only a few in Lisbon who will get to experience it. And I'm also afraid that most of the time, the people who come to a festival like Alcantara are, you know, we're preaching, we're preaching to the convert anyway, mm -hmm. you know, most times because, yeah. so, but at least it could be, I hope it can be like an extra stone sure. in the debate on how do we deal with our common history? Mm -hmm. 
How do we deal with it? Definitely, because uh, these um, these national artistic structures they they normal normally crystallize uh, the means of production, the ways of thinking, the the canons. So I, I think it's really transver transversal to the different different uh, contexts. But um, what I find it's brilliant is that you are you 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 come from a, a auto a self reflection which is something that we, we speak a lot in, the, in post-colonial studies, that we need to self-reflect on how are we a complice of the system. And it's true that normally there's a, a direct criticism to, against Euro, Eurocentric canon, but what you are doing is um, making a criticism on how African companies uh, mostly assumed this canon. Uh, in a in a in a colonial way, in in your case, in a specific case, I think that the success of your work is exactly on this efficient transnational dialogue that you are making between European and African artists, but not only artists, also structures, because I I read that when the the central the French Central National of Dance gave you the the opportunity of making a, a festival, and you created Le Cargo. Yeah. And you brought a lot of these African companies that presented their work for the first time in Europe. Exactly. And there I, there I can feel that there are some uh, power relations being questioned and, some, um, and the structures are being um, uh, moved. Uh, so I would like to think, uh, to ask you, you are working from Africa, looking at your country, formulating a critics not only to the Eurocentric canon, but the way that African countries borrowed Western codes just after their independence. Uh, but still, this decolonial wave of thought can easily become a new canon. So um, what, I, what I want to question, to, uh, question is, how do you protect your work from this assimilation? Because the decolonial approach sometimes it became a, a way of keeping artists in a map to, to keep them traveling. And what advices you can give to new artists, uh, what uh, tips you can give so that we don't follow into this endless assimilation process? I think you're really touching on to something essential for me today. Like when I decided to go back to Congo 19 years ago and work from there, uh, for me, it was with this idea that I wanted to tell stories from there and reflect from that place. Mm. But I was still, you know, kind of stuck in this, you know, model that I was telling stories from there, but actually to use the term market, was in Europe or it was in the West in, you know, in general. So until a few years ago, when I, was, I started asking myself the questions like, oh, so what is the difference between the mining company and what I'm doing since you know, ultimately it is about getting raw material from there, but for the enjoyment of a few of a few in the West, basically. So this became also like, you know, at the heart of the work. And when I started asking myself that question, I haven't found an answer yet, but I think today I'm really at this stage where it's becoming about how do I tell stories from home at home? Mm. How do I inscribe these stories as part of our lives and our reflections back home so that we can reverse um, the mechanism so it's no longer about taking from there and you know coming to show it here you know, uh, or wherever, but developing work there to be shared first and foremost down there. And then, if it can travel, it's just a bonus, but it's not the, you know, the primary objective. 
I think that's really, really where I find myself today. And mm. it's a way of, I think, this could, if the moment you know, we start asking ourselves the question about how to talk to our own people, mm. we probably will, we will probably be forced to invent other canons that take into account the complexity of life in our countries, in our cities, mainly, but also in our villages. And that's why like, I haven't been on stage in Europe since March because of the current health situation. Sure. But beginning of October, I performed again for the first time since March. But that happened in a village. I performed mm -hmm. a solo that I've been touring with uh, for almost 10 years now called Le Cargo also. Sure. And I took it to my maternal ancestors village. And I brought people together on the yard and I performed there. We took, you know, the sound and lighting equipment from the city and we went there and I performed there. So it's really part of this reflection of how do we make our work present, first of all, for our people on the continent. Mm. But, but this cannot be the only answer. Uh, but this is at least in my journey mm -hmm. today, that's where I find myself at. You are so proactive in your work. It's really like, wow, because uh, you are traveling from different dimensions, different contexts, and making this work focus on your country. What are the main struggles and what are the main privileges that make it possible for you? I would say that because the country is open, is not open, and because there is censorship, because there are all these obstacles, I feel that I need even more than ever to fight. Mm. And because I need it for myself, I, I feel that I need to be in the Congo today. I need to develop my work in a dialogue there with people who are there. I want to start a space where it can be possible for me not to be alone. And so Studio Kabako, our organization, is really this space where I bring a lot of people together and say, you know what, it's hard, but this is the only space we have. And so let's come together and get it, you know, get something going on. As Studio Kabako, we, we are always trying to make sure that we are a small house where other artists from the continent can feel safe. Definitely. So it's about using the network, using um, the foot I have inside the system to make it possible for us to be more and more and more tomorrow. So maybe it's a privilege, um, but it's also a sense of responsibility, knowing that because it's difficult, it is my responsibility to make something happen if I can. Yeah, that's a brilliant word. But um, there's always the, the, the borders as a problem. It's not something about the pandemic. This was always happening. How, how to, to live with this uh, in these times? How to work uh, like you do in several territories with these borders always reminding us that we are not completely free? I think for many years, I spent a lot of energy fighting against. Now I just want to fight for. If it can't work here, fine. Can we do it in the Congo, in Rwanda, in Kenya, you know, in Senegal, and where we just talk to one another, we can cross that border that was imposed upon us. I think that's really my position today. So uh, rather than 
fighting more and more to get a, a little corner of the table on the European table. Just like, okay, let's just invent our own table. Mm-hmm. Let's just try wherever we are to find other ways, other avenues. So, because if we establish that, maybe the problem we've had so far was that for many of us and for many, many years, the only avenues existed in Europe. And we never stopped to try and see what is it that we can find locally in our own communities. Mm -hmm. And so it's about time we started that work, really. And because the restrictions will be more and more. So how do we create resilient systems from local? realities from local possibilities sure. it might it, it might uh, you know it will probably mean that we need to rethink totally our uh, um, our relationship to production to the economy of our production we need to rethink all this but we need to begin this work sure. for me that's really what we need to do Yes, definitely. And you are making it brilliantly and it's really, really inspiring to to listen to you and to see your work. But it's definitely fighting to and not fighting against. I I will take that with me. (laughs) And thank you so much, Faustan, for this time. You're welcome. It was really, really a pleasure and hope to continue the conversation. Yes, definitely.